welcome uh, to the annual Roger W. Hines Lecture on Religion and Community. It's a lecture that's hosted by the Office for Religious Life and was established in 1994 in Hines' memory. Roger Hines was a resident of Atherton and he was a mem member of the Memorial Church congregation from 1977 until his death in 1995. Interesting, he retired to Atherton, to another side of the bay, having served as Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley from 1965 to 1971. My name is Jane Shaw, and I'm the Dean for Religious Life, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce the 2018 Heinz Lecturer, the Venerable Tenzin Priyadashi. He is the founder and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT, and director of the Ethics Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. He earlier served as the Buddhist chaplain at MIT, the first Buddhist chaplain. This year, we are very fortunate to have him here at Stanford as a Begruen Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, just up the hill by the golf course. Tenzin La was born into a Hindu Brahmin family in India, and at the age of 10, at his own volition, he entered a Buddhist monastery studying traditional Indo-Tibetan and Japanese Buddhism. He was ordained by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and has studied with a very wide range of significant Buddhist teachers. At the same time, he also received a secular education, receiving his bachelor's degree from Le Moyne College and completing graduate studies in comparative philosophy of religion at Harvard University in 2003. Tenzin La is engaged in worldwide humanitarian work developing projects that promote humanitarian aid and cultural understanding in countries such as India, Nepal, Japan, and Sri Lanka. And he lectures internationally on philosophy, science, ethics, and religion, while also teaching traditional Buddhist philosophy and practice. In recent years, he's become much sought after to speak about the range of ethics issues that are related to technology, especially artificial intelligence, and so we are really delighted that he has agreed to speak to us tonight on this vitally important subject that many people around Stanford are trying to get to grips with. So we are delighted that you're here, Tenzin La, and we welcome you very, very warmly. Thank you. Two men died, and they arrived at certain, as certain traditions suggest, in front of St. Peter's. St. Peter's looked at one gentleman and said, you did well down there. Here's the key to the silver chamber. And he looked at the other gentleman and said, you did quite well too, and here is the key to the gold chamber. The gentleman who received the key to the silver chamber was a priest. Uh, he got a bit offended and he said to St. Peter's, St. Peter, with all due respect, I think there is some mistake. I was a priest, a minister, preaching the good word down there. The guy next to me is just an immigrant cab driver from New York. St. Peter's looked at him and said, priest, there is no mistake. When you preached, people slept. When he drove, people prayed. I've often tried to think of my talk as driving in India uh, and, and not sort of have too many pre-planned slides. So I would approach this uh, with uh, uh, a sense of informality, uh, but, uh, but I hope it's appropriate for, for this. Firstly, uh, thank you so very much. I'm, I'm delighted and honored uh, to be here and to have this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts, uh, and thoughts that are rather current, uh, relevant, some that have been there for some time, some that are still uh, percolating on a daily basis, uh, given the nature of the topic itself, artificial intelligence, and where we are with it. So I think I'll try to structure my talk more like a session of jazz. Uh, I'll give you some highlights. Uh, you're welcome to weave it together, and then I look forward to the conversation, and perhaps there'll be an opportunity to go in depth uh, in uh, 
some of the areas that, that I might have mentioned or forgotten to mention. English is my fifth language, so forgive me on, uh, sometimes the translation works a bit slow, but it will eventually come out. Uh, the reason why a Buddhist monk gets interested in artificial intelligence after spending a range of time doing theoretical physics is because of relevance. Relevance implying that it is not only a subject, but it's a framework or range of technologies that is going to change, shape human civilization forever. And what I mean by forever is that I've come to recognize that human beings actually romanticize the phrase learning from mistakes we seldom do. And more importantly, when it comes to something of greater impact to humanity, such as artificial intelligence, perhaps we cannot afford to learn from mistakes. Meaning that traditionally what our model has been is to design a technology, deploy it, and in the process of deployment and studying it, if something goes wrong, then we say, okay, let's go back and rectify it. We made a mistake, we made an error, Let's learn from it. But in the last 20 years or so, because we have been so preoccupied with the idea of scaling up, scaling at various spaces, we have been so occupied with uh, the sense of penetration of how fast, how quickly, how pervasive uh, certain technology platforms can be, that there is no place to make error with artificial intelligence in the sense of how fast it can impact human civilization, human society, that we might actually not have the opportunity to turn back and say, ah, that's where error was made. Or that's where we could have done better. Let me give you an example. So as most of you are aware that we are struggling right now uh, with all, all kinds of excitements and hypes around two kinds of artificial intelligence. One, a specialized form of artificial intelligence that you constantly hear about from different platforms, uh, which is sort of a, a more modified version of machine learning, uh, such as Facebook algorithms. You hear from uh, Google DeepMind, uh, the game of Go. You hear from IBM Watson on how we use specialized intelligence to work with medicine and so on. And then there is this artificial general intelligence that we believe will perhaps solve everything, at least some people do and that it's going to sort of uh, create uh, a future that very few are able to actually articulate as to what future that might look like. Now, what I meant by error, firstly, so let me touch a bit on the ethical side of things, and then perhaps we can touch a bit more also on the religious framework, the religious side of things. There's a private company that deploys AI based softwares to criminal justice systems, to judicial systems in the United States. And much of the system is trained on a set of data from decades ago that are heavily riddled with human biases. Riddled with human biases in the sense of how judicial processes were done based on a person's color of skin, based on the person's race, gender, and so on and so forth. More importantly also, which locality or neighborhood the person lived in. And you give that set of data to a group of engineers who have no training in qualitative analysis of the data. All they're supposed to do is train the machine learning algorithm to create a system of efficiency around that data. And you create a system that judges then are encouraged to use because it will save time, they're going to see be able to sort of evaluate more cases that come to their court. Now judges are interesting creatures. We have a bunch of data that suggests that whether the judge, whether a particular judge's favorite sports team lost the night before or won the game night before can actually determine how the judgments were given the next day. Like there is a very interesting correlation we have data suggesting that what the judge ate for lunch has correlations with how they give judgments or they issue judgments after lunch. 
meaning whether the person has the likelihood to, likelihood to get a parole or get a bail or would be sent to prison. Now, we know that all those biases exist. Judicial system is aware of that. There is not much intervention around it. Now, imagine that these judges are given these systems for the purpose of efficiency and convenience. Now, which are already trained on pre-existing bias set of data. So what you have now is a machine learning or AI engine, which is biases on steroids. More importantly, there are biases that are at a breeding at a space that you can't even point out and say there is the bias. And as we often see, as it happened with the advent of computers also, that it becomes much more easy then to assign or allocate moral agency to the machine and say, if something went wrong, it wasn't my fault. I just input the data that I saw, and the platform decided what the sentencing should be. Now, the challenge with this happens is that you can imagine that while we are having social movements and conversations around fairness, bias, already evaluating justice system, introducing such kinds of platforms, it may create efficiency, but it's not going to actually encourage fairness. It won't encourage justice as civic society deems fair. We had issues where facial recognition systems. We had a graduate student. Uh, uh, she's now a researcher at the MIT Media Lab. And she was studying some of these facial recognition systems. And she kept trying for the algorithm to recognize her face. And the algorithm would continue to fail. She was African American. She puts in another black person, and the algorithm fails to register the face. Turns out that the facial recognition algorithm was trained on a bunch, bunch of Caucasian faces. And so there is the bias that breeds. In China, they decided that they are going to use facial recognition system for predictive policing. So it's a it's sort of uh, a new sort of technological angle on something like you know, ancient primitive phrenology. You know, remember when there was a time when people used to look at the shape of your head and determine whether you are bound to become a criminal or not. Okay. They started to use this kind of algorithmic system to determine that just by facial recognition whether we can predict how likelihood it is for you to become a criminal. Now, these are some of the things that are out there. They're not theoretical. They're not being worked in the labs. They are part of social systems. And you can imagine that any private venture that spends a ton of capital in developing these kinds of platforms makes sure that they actually pervade the system in a manner that they cannot be recalled, that they cannot be returned, unless and until, again, some big noise happens. Now, even if somebody makes noise, by the time it happens, how many people have been sentenced to prison unfairly for unfair period of time, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the challenges that we, with, that we see in some of the AI systems, especially in these specialized AI systems. The issue becomes this, which is that many of these systems are designed for efficiency. They're not designed for empathy. Efficiency is a useful tool. It's a useful thing, but it is not the only thing that drives human behavior, that drives human society. Meaning that if we were simply striving for efficiency, we will stop taking care of the old. We will stop taking care of the incapacitated. We will stop taking care of people who have any form of mental or physical limitations because it is inefficient. But our social contract dictates that these are the individuals that need to be taken care of from more able-bodied individuals in the society. Why? Because of the sense of empathy, the empathetic connection that we form with such individuals and the notion of a unified civic fabric. Then we come to certain kinds of algorithms that individuals design that you might have heard in the news recently because it cost us election in this country, which is that algorithms that are designed to sort of augment certain kind of human behavior, or human dispositions around narcissism and self-validation. So here's the thing, which is that we know that human beings are 
tribal by nature. And we can give all kinds of evolutionary arguments around it. Right? However, we also know that human beings have the capacity at times to grow out of the tribal environment. More importantly, that we have the capacity to coexist peacefully, that we don't need to coexist as porcupines, okay? where we are going our merry way and then we see a threat and the needles come out. We have the capacity to override porcupinal algorithms in our brain. And that's a mark of an evolved society. That's a mark of an evolved civilization. But then individuals or a group of individuals who are writing such algorithms to facilitate conversation between interested minds or interested groups did not heed the warning that they were actually augmenting silos. Silos of such conversation that again put this tribal instinct on steroids. We have digitized tribalism. We have digitized tribalism in a way that it's not just functioning on the way of how we look, how we speak to each other, which communities we live in, but we are able to sort of bring together individuals at greater distance who believe in similar kinds of bias. So it's, it's sort of a bias-driven algorithm on, on, on that end. Right. And as a result of that, you know, we never thought that social media would have been a threat to <coughs> institutions that we hold so dear, such as democracy, such as financial systems, and so on. When I see these things, when I observe these things, the issue becomes that why are platforms designed in this manner? Why are platforms designed in this manner? And people who are designing it, how adept are they in doing actual qualitative analysis? Qualitative analysis around that the data that I'm receiving, is it riddled with biases? If it is riddled with, bi riddled with biases, is it my civic responsibility to try to clear it up because it is going to simply put certain kinds of thinking, certain kinds of mindsets and institutionalize it in a way that might be detrimental to the well-being of civic society. So that's one part of the concern that much of my work today is focused on and dealing with. The other part of the concern is the imbalance in equations. So I do believe that artificial intelligence, specialized artificial intelligence, will actually do some things wonderful in especially the area of, say, healthcare and education. But here's the challenge. Okay. You take an AI system that is trained in oncological diagnosis, and you start deploying it. You start training it in countries like India or Thailand. And there are surgeons in the room. And what I'm told by designers of, of, of the system that seven surgeons in the room would sort of get in conflict with the diagnosis that the AI is giving. And 70% of the time, the surgeons are wrong. You, if you are a patient, or if I'm a patient suffering from that illness, and if I know that statistics, or whether that statistics is popularized, or whether there's uh, some concrete data behind it, but if I become aware of that statistics, and then I'm lying in an operation theater, who am I more likely to trust? the seven physicians who are supervising me, or the AI system. So part of the challenge that also is becoming is that we are deploying systems at a rate, but we are not actually retraining physicians. We are not, we're not retraining lawyers. We are not retraining teachers or educators to work with these platforms, to work with the system. So you often see collisions because, again, the primitive brain tells us that you can beat the system. You can beat these engines. So that has been, you see, kind of pros and cons on, on both ends. But the bigger question that lies around the advent of AI, okay, and again, I'm not anti-AI, I'm not anti-technology. Okay. I just wish that they were more informed. Okay. And so here is the challenge that we come to. First is that if you talk to individuals who are proponents evangelizing the notion of artificial general intelligence. They give you a version of utopia, of a world where 
we will have free time, a lot of free time. Why? Because they will set up a structure in an ideal society where everybody will be taken care of by something called universal basic income. And it all sounds wonderful. And this is one of the beauty of Silicon Valley, which is that they crank out deceptive stories like no other. <laughs> That's another one of my interests. I'm, I'm really interested in the issue of self-deception, self-deception in individuals and organizations and how they sort of take over social norms. So imagine a world, they suggest, where individuals will have free time and their needs will be taken care of by UBI. Now, the traces that we hear of, that we heard in the advent of capitalism, right, that there will be a time when people will have adequate and more than adequate to make their ends meet. Meaning that what the proposal around universal basic income undermines is, again, two things. Human greed and deceit. Which is that simply because I'm given by whatever standards people think I should be living with or I should be living by. Will that actually automatically create the mindset or create the behavior of contentment? And if not, what else would it generate? The second part of it becomes is that we as human species actually never have had good history with what we do with free time. Individually, we have struggled with it. Collectively, we don't know what we would do. You see, a society that is sitting idle with a lot of free time. Meaning that the notion of just free time is not sufficient. The issue becomes what else can be done in that free time, whether we are going to, as species, use that free time creatively, or whether we are going to sort of go out and destroy one another. So those are, again, some of the challenges that we need to sort of think through before we begin to romanticize the idea of free time and universal basic income. Now, why I bring in the religious notions in this thing is because first thing is religion as a tradition or religious traditions, they are not efficient. They're efficient in certain ways, efficient in certain ways that if you look at the tools of contemplative tradition that allows us to override certain behavioral patterns to become better, ver better versions of ourselves, those are efficient tools. But as a system, it's not efficient. And it's not efficient because most religious systems have tried to give primacy to the notion of compassion and kindness, which is not efficient. And I think efficiency is a bit overrated sometimes. You know. Uh, I have tried to suggest to people that the most efficient thing we can actually do is just die. <laughs> because you know that that is where we are heading to. Right? Even if you upload your brain to robots or, or to an AI system, physical body is going to die. And if we are simply preoccupied with the sense of efficiency, then what we do in between actually doesn't matter that much. You see? Again, that's a storytelling that, that, that we are telling ourselves. So it's not just merely driven by efficiency. Our life is not merely driven by efficiency. So this, this facade that we create, that we want to be efficient beings, or that we want to be efficient creatures, efficient systems, I think is a fallacy. Religious systems actually at least point to this idea that no matter how we think of efficiency, we must give primacy to a sense of empathy. And empathy is something that is lacking a fair amount in all of our conversations from tech design to policy making to the election. And the challenge is that lack of empathy at this stage is a public health issue. Everything, all things that you see problematic in our society You can come, you can boil it down, you can do an analysis, and the root cause will be somewhere around lack of empathy. <coughs> so for me, part of the question becomes is that can we design a system that acts as a mirror 
an AI system that acts as a mirror that actually allows us to grow in certain directions. That it is not just about delegating certain aspects of our intelligence to a system, but using it, in fact, to grow, to perform better in different set of virtues or different set of values. And that's why at Media Lab, we tend to use the word or the expression extended intelligence. See? Meaning that it is something that is not only extending uh, the limitations of our cognitive faculty in terms of how fast we can process things, uh, how much data we can contain, how, much, how many things we can evaluate at the same time. But what it is also doing is it is acting as a mirror to allow us to grow in certain ways which is it gives us certain kinds of feedback on our behavioral uh, limitations and how we sort of evolve out of it. But the challenge that becomes is, is that artificial general intelligence and their proponents are not only stopping at that. You will see certain popular media articles that speak of AGI as becoming God. Why? Because it will have characteristics of omniscience. And this is where I think Sometimes the tech industry becomes too zealous about certain propositions, meaning that when we speak of omniscience, it's just not about knowledge. See? It's about wisdom. And the transference from this idea of knowledge to wisdom is something that we need to, again, be clear about, meaning that gathering of data sets, storing data sets, processing data sets does not necessarily imply cultivation of wisdom. It does not necessarily imply a rise in wisdom which the current systems are designed to do. Whether a AGI will become conscious or not is another issue, which is that you know, we, you know, I have a bunch of neuroscience friends sitting here. Uh, we can argue you know, for months about what version of consciousness do we believe in or do we not believe in. Right? There's no agreement around it. So then again, it becomes a similar kind of model we, where we take certain kinds of reductionist approach to create these kinds of platforms. At the same time, for me, the interest is in the idea that can I train artificial general intelligence or any form of AI to be introspective? What would it look like? What would it look like to design an algorithm that is not simply designed to process itself in a loop and evaluating the data, but to be able to say that this doesn't look good qualitatively, that this needs to be eliminated qualitatively. That would be an AI system I can get behind, meaning that allowing it to have certain kinds of faculties as introspection. I don't know what it would look like in an AI system. But if we are talking about overriding biases and we are speaking of AI systems to become self-sufficient in terms of not having humans in the loop, constantly trying to verify the, the quality or the nature of data, and we want to completely eliminate biases, we have to create an introspective AI. Again, I don't know what it might look like, but there are tools in contemplative tradition of learning that you can utilize in training those sets of data or training those systems. Then, of course, with AGI, we can also come to the sense that will they take over the world? And that's the doomsday scenario. I don't know why we have so much fascination with apocalypse or apocalyptic scenarios. Uh, partly it's your neighbors in Southern California who add to it, uh, Hollywood and uh, associates. But the other part of it is that it creates sort of an unnecessary kind of anxiety about the future, rather than to be able to creatively think about it. Right? Unnecessary form of anxiety, meaning that when AI takes over the world, see? and when AI takes over the world, it's not going to be overnight. Okay? There will be other sort of incremental episodes, you see. So I'll be more careful about labor displacement issues. I'll be more careful about the idea of you know, massive depression in a society where you're going to lose jobs to robots and AI, despite of what the companies tell you. Uh, you know, traditionally, our model has been that we have sort of, especially politicians and lawmakers, they have evoked 
and monopolized you know, the, the segment of, on, on human resilience by saying that, oh, it's all right. You know, these skills are taken by machines or automation. Only if you acquire other skill sets, you'll be employed. But we are forgetting that AI is qualitatively different from any other form of automation that we have seen in the past. AI is mother of all automations. We will run out of the argument about employable skills. We'll run out of the argument that now you should, employ, you should learn these skills so that you will be employable. Because it is going to infiltrate in every aspect of job opportunities and employable skills. And then, of course, you know, it, it also raises deeper questions around meaningful work for individuals, especially in a society that for past 100 years or post-industrial revolution has been driven by the sense of my identity is my work. If you're born in India, you would have other options. You won't be over-identifying with your work. But here you are, so you'll have to learn again about what this notion of identity implies. So I'll be more concerned about those kinds of incremental scenarios for a society that is already being worn down by the level of loneliness, by the level of depression, as to what this might do and whether our governmental and social systems are strong enough and capable enough to handle all that. But for the future, I think, if AI was, in the best case scenario, to become intelligent enough to be deemed the label of another species, then wouldn't it be wonderful to have another species that is slightly more empathetic than we are? And so perhaps it's time to start not only growing empathy amongst ourselves, but also in platforms that we design for the future. I'll take a pause here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think we can just open up the room to questions. So I might open with the first one. So there's quite a lot of Stanford educators in this room. Um, so what would you say to them about how we need to develop the kinds of courses we teach and the kind of curriculum we have to address the issues you've just raised? And I think there are scientists and humanities scholars and social scientists in the room, if I look around. I think the argument that a lot of tech, tech companies are making is that in the future, perhaps, humanities will be a safer discipline. Um, you might get uh, a slight bump in uh, employability of individuals who are training in tech sectors for next 10, 15, 20 years, and so on. Uh, but you know, the joke is that the coders are actually coding themselves out of jobs. You know? um, I think, I think you know, universities are at an interesting juncture because unfortunately uh, we have been in denial about this, but how university functions is that we become a, a, a feeding pipe for the industries. So market drives what we teach our students. Yeah. So I think at some point universities will begin to ask if they're not already asking is that what are the subjects we can teach that will ensure that, our, that the skills that we give to students are relevant and employable in 10 years from now? Because imagine right. getting a Stanford degree and then recognizing that there's nothing catering to your skill sets. Thank you. I was thinking a little bit more also about if you want the platforms to be inculcated with empathy, essentially. If you want, I mean, I suppose I'm saying, do you want do you want engine, how do you want engineers to put empathy into the things they're designing? I think that's what I'm really asking. Or how, right. no, you know, so what's the ideal education? Uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think uh, there are two issues with that. One is that uh, you know, encouraging students who do wish to graduate an engineering degree to ha with an engineering degree to have actually uh, several courses in humanities around <laughs> especially around behavioral sciences, uh, empathy. Uh, there are certain groups, like even including at Stanford, that uh, do pay attention to such as you know, uh, human-centered technology and mm -hmm. so on. But it needs to be more than seeing simply humans as, as, as consumers. 
but, but looking at you know, whether it actually contributes to some element of growth or not. Otherwise what happens is we get excited about, for example, you know, about what sort of apps or platforms we can design that would uh, you know, monopolize human attention. And then when we come to a stage where we begin to start criticizing that and saying, well, we have created a whole monopoly out of yeah. attention, uh, meaning there's a whole economy around attention, how do we now start to reclaim that? It feels yeah. we've got to that point. We have, yeah. we have. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, we're further. So, I mean, the thing is, if you look at you know any kind of uh, training mechanism. Okay. So part of the part of the issue is that you know how we think machine learning systems learn about any kind of feature is oftentimes based on templates replicate, replicating how humans learn. Okay. But we haven't sort of in the mainstream decoded the idea or, or a template around empathy learning. So, so every culture has a different take on it. Every society has a different take on it. But we haven't sort of made it, made it mainstream. And I think that's one of the areas where we can actually look into certain traditions that have spent hundreds if not thousands of years uh, purposefully looking at how do we change behavioral mindsets in individuals to become more empathetic. And empathetic is just the beginning of it. You know, uh, you know, people get too excited that with, with empathy argument that, oh, we can just do certain things that will create mass empathy. And and I'm, I'm, I often have to remind individuals that creating empathy is not the difficult part; sustaining it is. Mm. Okay. So one should not sort of become self-congratulatory with the idea that oh, I have empathy. The issue becomes that, am I able to build on it? Built on it in terms of values of kindness, compassion, and so on. Okay. And then, am I able to enact on it? Okay. So um, just to follow up, um, neuroscientists will be your next group. What would you say after that? Any discussions on those? Uh, well, without giving much away, we, we do have a team that has just embarked on it. Um, that is an interdisciplinary team. And I think you know, that's part of the thing, going back to the same question, is that you know, we need more interdisciplinary environments for designing these kinds of platforms. You, you just can't have a bunch of engineers designing something that would simply augment their worldviews in, in, into society. Yes. For a 21st century religion where you just sort of lose a lot of identity, even if it is individual identity, say you leave the industrial revolution, let's say that you shift to play work. And today, as you pointed out, we identify with work or with economic centers. With AI and maybe the displacement of work, do you see that shifting back and the role that religion plays? Maybe it will evolve, but do you see that changing its importance in our lives? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, honestly. The thing is that you know, religious institutions are more resilient than people give it credit for. Okay? Like if you look at, you know, if you compare it with competitive markets, um, it's remarkable how long religious institutions have survived. Okay? Um, and despite of many predictions and, and prophecies around the death of religion or religious systems, especially in this country, religious institutions are thriving. Okay? And so the, at least certain kinds of religious institutions are thriving. Uh, so part of the issue becomes, for the future, we don't know whether it will be religious institutions that will sort of take the role again of uh, providing a framework for identity, or will it be something else? Will it be a sense of tribalism without religious background? Um, I want to go back to the issue of empathy in machines or machine learning and, and AI. Um, I'm just having a sort of conceptual mm -hmm. problem. Can you hear me? Is it working? Um, getting my head around the idea of a machine having empathy um, because of the inwardness yes. or the self-consciousness, right. I might say that that seems to presuppose. And also, um, it's, it seems to me that one of the conditions of human empathy is that we're embodied creatures that can imagine ourselves in being in the place of an other. So, um, I mean, the, the, 
the root of empathy is pathos, right? right. So um, when you have a machine that's disembodied, so to speak, how is it going to feel my pain right, um, right. and respond and correct and so forth? No, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, let me put it this way, is that it's not that machines are going to be empathetic. The, the idea is that whether machines can help humans to grow in empathy. That's, that's one thing that I'm pushing for. The other part of it is that it's not necessarily that we want machines to become empathetic, but can we break down empathy into certain kinds of conditions okay, that machines are able to recognize? Okay. So are machines able to recognize certain <laughs> symptoms of empathy to be able to say, sorry, I won't follow this command? Okay. Uh, destroy this person. You see? So one of the challenges that I see is uh, AI in the battlefield. Uh, by most accounts, you know, just this past year, I'm told that China and, and the US have allocated about 40 billion just in the research on AI in the battlefield. Now, what it does is basically gives us more liberty to engage in war. Because one of the deterrents for not going to war is our sons and daughters will die. Now imagine, and it'll be again, you know, it'll be, you know, certain top countries with AI in the battlefield. Other countries will still have humans fighting. Right? You get into the civilian population right now. What are the criteria with which a machine can determine with some degree of precision this is not the person to shoot at? So it's not necessarily empathy. It could be symptomatic, but there can be other conditions that we could look into programming. Uh, yes, yes, at the back. Yeah. Yeah. A microphone is coming to you. Hello? OK. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> in a practical sense, a lot of the cutting edge AI research comes out of big companies like Google or Facebook, and their ultimate goal seems to be economic gain and benefit. So I'm kind of confused, how do you convince those big companies to incorporate empathy into their AI research when it seems at odds with money? I'm, I'm not entirely sure that Empathy is an odds with their money uh, issue, uh, meaning that it's, it's not that it's mutually exclusive. Uh, in fact, there are people who are seriously thinking about it. Um, you know, what is at odds are other aspects of virtue that we hold dear, such as attention. What happens if we are able to retrain the consumers to tend to other things that might be more fulfilling, uh, uh, or, or where they derive more of a sense of fulfillment? That might not be good for that industry. Uh, uh, you know, those are, those are the things that will be more challenging. Part of the other issue becomes is that, you know, I don't believe that, well, at least as a monk, I like to give benefit of doubt. I don't believe that people running these, com these companies are necessarily individuals who have malicious intent or that they want to actually harm the world uh, purposefully. Right? Uh, so I do believe that some of, our, some of them are more concerned about it. it. It's just a question of whether they do something actionable around it. Uh, and sometimes it might happen at the face of criticism, but then it might be too late at times, as we are seeing with Facebook. Um, you know, uh, they were perhaps even made aware four or five years ago uh, around how they were promoting silos, uh, how they were promoting the sense of uh, digital tribalism of, of some sort. Uh, they didn't think it was a big issue. Now, with all forms of social criticism, they believe it's a big issue and they might try to rectify it, we'll see. There was a gentleman with a black t-shirt who was going to ask a question earlier. Yeah, there. Thank you. 
institutions and also enlisted more than people to guide them towards like our opening states, the expanded state of consciousness. Um, with the field could be like a sort of like a paradigm shift. So we're focusing on um, current societal problems and war, but um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts on AI in this, like in a, a use where it can use um, like the power of the, the intuitional uh, solver system of Google's AlphaGo to understand the way that the human mind, mind works, to like help guide us right. um, towards uh, like higher states of consciousness. I would be happy if they can create an AI system that can act as a spiritual counselor so I can retire and go back to my cave in the Himalayas. Uh, I look forward to that day. I don't think that's going to happen. I think right now there's plenty of hype around the capability. You see, we, we, don't, we cannot use the word intuition and machine learning in the same phrase uh, at, at this moment. Uh, you know, uh, so I, I think it, it, it takes a little more than that to have intuitive qualities around things. And, and the other part of it is that even diagnosis, you see, uh, it's one thing to be diagnosing uh, physical illnesses of, of some sort. We don't even have very good diagnostic methods for depression. Okay. Um, so it becomes a challenge to then say that here we have a machine learning or AI platform designed to diagnose people of spiritual problems or mental problems that a spiritual counselor might say. I hope it can be done. I can then be busy with other things. Thank you. Other questions? Gentleman at the back. Yeah. I think of what you were saying about all the funding that's going to build and kill robots. And isn't a lot of the problem we see with the lack of, I guess, empathy in machines due to the fact that we invest so much money into destroying other countries? Probably, probably. I think it's unfortunate. I, I wish they invested more on other things, but here we are. The problem is I, I think it, it is going to start a similar kind of race that we saw during the Cold War era. Um, you know, it's, it's right now sort of kind of under the wraps because we are busy with other things that occupy the noise bandwidth. Uh, but, uh, you know, robotic technology in defense is what's going to sort of give control. You know, and, and already, uh, you know, presidents and leaders of friendly countries like the Russian Federation have declared that whoever controls AI controls the world. Jim. Tenzin, I was just, uh, you alluded to uh, having systems that can. Uh, if you will, make us better. And, and in some ways, uh, the question is, what motivates you to be better? If you look at uh, what China is doing, as an example, they have a system, which I'm sure you're aware of, whereby they use facial recognition, they monitor your movements, and then they decide whether you're a good enough citizen mm -hmm. to, to be rewarded for your social goodness. But of course, it's who decides what social goodness is. Yes. I think, uh, I mean, one part of it becomes is that is whether something allows individuals to grow in certain direction. And that direction could be either determined by society or it could be determined by individual norms. Um, you know, just like we use certain kinds of platforms, including certain gaming platforms, to become better at certain skill sets. Uh, many of which are driven by, again, efficiency algorithms. I think there could be systems that could be designed that allows us to understand relationships better. Uh, how do you relate to one another with more awareness, for example? So you know, something that tells you, are you aware of these things about this individual that you have been married to and living with for 20 years so that you don't wake up as a stranger one day in the morning? So part of it is just, the, the sense of alertness that such systems could prime in us on a regular basis that allows us to keep track of, of certain things. Uh, I think you know, surveillance and all these things are going to remain. I, I think you know, there are certain arguments that I believe we have lost. Privacy is one of them. Um, you know, uh, we can try to come up with creative structures to 
create a firewall around privacy issues. But privacy is going to be a very expensive thing in the future. Yes, gentleman over there with the green shirt. You know, I, I, one thing I should also suggest is, is that it's, it's not always also that things are established in terms of protocols. You know, we just take it for granted that we'll live in a society where, uh, where, where things will become, you know, wonderful sort of synergy between machines and humans. You know, even if you take something very simple as uh, self-driving cars. Okay? Uh, uh, there's a group at the lab that, uh, uh, you know, did a uh, couple of million user study uh, around various scenarios and how they would like their self-driving car to make decisions. And scenarios were mostly around, you know, who should the car hit, you see, if, if you're posed in, in, in a certain kind of situation. And one scenario was given that, you know, if you were to kill five people, including a pregnant woman and so on, uh, versus the choice of the car to self-destruct by killing the owner or even the owner and the family in the car, what would you do? Now, in these kinds of scenarios, and they have, there are limitations to these kinds of studies as well, but mo in, in these kinds of scenarios, most individuals tend to make utilitarian decisions. So they'll make a utilitarian decision and say, yes, in an extreme scenario, the car should self-destruct. But I will not buy that car. However, other people should. <laughs> so you, you, you create you know, certain kinds of you know, uh, friction, even in terms of how you're going to design a policy uh, around uh, making these things mainstream. Um, I'm glad you brought up the topic of self-driving cars because it seems pretty obvious to me at least that um, an AI that's designed and owned by Uber is going to be significantly different than an AI designed and owned by your favorite local charity. Mm -hmm. So the question is what part of society, if any, is going to have the responsibility of enforcing empathy into AIs? Is this a role for government or for some other part of society? And can it be done? So that's exactly what we are lacking behind. Uh, that's exactly what we are lacking behind because uh, we actually don't have very robust framework around enforcement. Uh, uh, governments in general are often behind in terms of policies around technology. Okay? And the, the, when it comes to, you know, it's not just enough to have policies. You need an agency to enforce it. And governments, I do believe, are better suited for enforcement purposes. Yeah. But we don't even have a proper understanding of what sort of policies should be in place. Okay. Uh, I mean, you look at you know, things that we, we are doing with net, net neutrality, the things we have done prior to that with internet. There, there was often a time lag between deployment of technology and the policies that were there to govern it. EU has been, I think, uh, you know, more sort of uh, on top of things. Uh, and then there's a difference, you know, in the, in the US, uh, and somewhat even in the European Union, despite of active citizen participation, uh, in a democratic framework, you always have room for lim litigation. Okay? So you come up with a policy, companies might not agree with it, and you litigate for, uh, you know, for some time. In a country like China, things are advancing much quickly because if the government says, this is how it's going to be, that's how it's going to be. Can we, can we grab the mic? Yeah, thanks. Going back to your earlier question about empathy um, being marked by the ability to introspect and whether a machine can ever do that. Um, we were having an earlier conversation about uh, unconscious mechanisms of empathy, mirroring behaviors and such. Um, which suggests that there at some point has been an evolutionary efficiency to empathy. Um, and then you get into how it promotes, how it works positively within a tribal right. setting and, and what the barriers are between inside and outside. Right. If, if we're using empathy as sort of the baseline value of what would make AI better or more humane, um, are we looking at those boundaries. Let, let me be clear. I'm not proposing that AIs will become empathetic. I'm not proposing that. I am 
suggesting that there could be certain conditions that may be symptomatic to the idea of empathy that could use it, that could be used in precise scenarios of how a machine reacts or responds to user situation scenarios on the set. Also, empathy is a good starting point. Okay. Uh, part of the thing, when, when you go back to contemplative tools again, is you know, the scenario that most of us, even when we experience empathy, it's a very biased form of empathy. Right? Meaning the, the ease with which we relate to people who look like us, speak the same language, perhaps have the same belief system and so on. There's nothing heroic about biased empathy. Meaning you know, Jim can tell you that if something is not you know, miswired in your brain, you have the natural capacity for it. The contemplative tool part comes in is that can we build on it to create an unbiased empathy? Right. So the idea that you know, creating a kind of empathy that is not actually determined by functions that drove biased forms of empathy. Then the idea whether you can build on it virtues or aspects of kindness or compassion. Then whether you can build on it virtues such as limitless compassion, what the Buddhists propose, which is where the object of compassion could be anybody. And there's nothing triggering that, but that's sort of the state of mind, the state of contem contemplative mind that it has come to be. So baseline empathy is simply a state where we are pointing to that, it's, it, that the human brain is capable of it, and the human society should become capable of it. And that's the whole idea around promoting empathy in individuals, relations, organizations, and societies. But part of the issue becomes is that, you know, too often, and, and this is not to undermine you know, the wonderful work of behavioral sciences, but too often we use behavioral science as an excuse to say, but that's how evolution happens, that, that that's an evolutionary argument. We have seen outliers. Okay? We have seen outliers who are able to override some of these functions. Why not study them? Why not figure out how is it that they were able to disrupt some of these systems? Yes. So you've suggested a challenge to the training of engineers by perhaps taking some courses in humanities. That would but be a good start. That, that does that feels like not even a start. It 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 you actually are dealing with cultural and worldview yeah. transformations that actually would trickle down and up within a very large technical operation so that it is a it's a feature that is of huge priority mm -hmm. you know just like you're not going to run off the road in the self-driving car it has to be at that level that there is a map and an in organization in transnational tremendous commitment to begin to build AI systems that actually are constantly reevaluating their consequences for some kind of greater good. How do you see, in practical terms, creating the opening that uh, addresses new projects in that direction that, that actually is a big enough bend in the river? So let me first, again, clarify that I don't think at this stage we are going to look into whether AI have the capacity or capability to evaluate consequences. I'm talking about the, 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 leadership. The, the leadership around that. Um, I think it's, it's always useful to have other disciplines in the room. That's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, because part of the thing is our mental dispositions are such that we are trained to think in certain way. If I'm not misquoting, actually, for example, after 9-11 I got interested in this, this research um, uh, by Fundamentalism Project at, at the University of Chicago. And one of the in, uh, interesting anecdotes that they made was that most educated religious fanatics are engineers by training. Right? And that sort of prompted this thinking as to why. Why does this happen? Right? And you start to look into the templates. You start to look at behavioral dispositions. You start to look at that behavioral disposition is such that there's a certain segment of population that is very comfortable only with binary outcomes. Okay. Whereas much of human society is not. Okay. We operate between binary outcomes. Okay. 
So part of the issue becomes that when you design a complex system, you need to take into account those kinds of variables and individuals who would be able to advise on that. So that would be a start. That's why it's a bad idea just to have engineers in the room designing things. Uh, and, 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 and then, you know, part of the thing is that because of PR, certain companies will say, no, no, but we had an ethicist in the room as well. But part of the challenge is that ethicist is generally a lawyer, and, and, and the lawyer is generally <laughs> concerned. Yes. Again, as a bank, I'm giving benefit of doubt to lawyers. But, but to clarify my point is that there's a big distinction between ethics and compliance. And, and what most companies are focused on is the compliance framework, not the ethical framework. And that's why my emphasis is that we need to enter a new kind of mindset where we're, we're talking about ethical by design. That ethics and ethical frameworks need to be introduced for optimization purposes in the beginning of the design process. Yes. Um, so I, um, we've been talking about the types of global changes that we could probably introduce to help the society be more ethical and empathetic. But I wanted to give an example of an individual. This is a concrete example of my own cousin who is an, um, get, got his PhD from MIT in um, computer programming of dynamic, flu fluid dynamics. Um, so un unpredictable chaotic behavior of fluids and he got hired into the financial district in Chicago. And I, the, we all know by now the 2008 financial disaster was because of exactly this type of behavior. So I was trying to tell him and make him aware of the type of training he's getting from the financial district, uh, financial sector is not the type of training that will make him understand what they're asking of him and why. They, they're only training him to do what they want him to do and right. he'll just do it without knowing what the consequences are. And he actively, knowing him, I grew up with him, we did charity work together. <laughs> I know him to be an empathetic person and have empathy. However, he was not willing to begin to understand the ramifications of what he can do because it was in direct conflict with the money and the profit he's going to be making uh, doing the job that he had with a very good salary and a lot of bonus. So I think the fundamental problem we need to deal with is the individuals will always do what's good for them. And what's good for them right now in a capitalistic society is make more money, be comfortable. Perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure about that. Uh, uh, I, I know of a lot of people with a lot of money once they have made money, want to do something else with their life. Right? And yes, there is this sense of messaging that we do send out that first become a billionaire and then become a philanthropist and will be well respected in society, which I think is a wrong messaging. Uh, but but I, 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 I do sympathize with your point and, and that was one of the reasons why we launched the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics at MIT precisely for this reason at the height of the financial meltdown, which is that Universities and educational systems need to play a much needed crucial role, in fact it's civic responsibility for educational institutions to design ethics learning programs that are relevant to students. And it's not about lecturing, it's about creating proper pedagogies that will actually change longitudinal behaviors. The problem is again, you know, that, that unfortunately universities like, like many social systems respond to criticism. So, you know, in 2008, 2009, when the meltdown was happening, you know, Financial Times ran an article questioning whether universities should even claim that they are educating leaders for the future. And especially business schools, shouldn't they be simply content with the idea that they're training able managers? You see? Because leadership should not be driven by the sense of greed and deceit that was being exemplified in, in financial systems. And so, one of the neighboring universities thought it was a good idea to start a pledge. Pledges have never worked. I can tell you I have 272 pledges that I have taken by virtue of wearing this role. Okay. You need training to be able to fulfill those pledges. The other part of it becomes in the academic setting is that we simply escalate what we think we are most familiar with. So another 
uh, business school, what they did was they started doing case studies. So it was a course on business ethics, and they were doing case studies. And they used the case studies of that time, BP and Enron and so on. Students walk out of the class. I asked them, what did you learn? They said, we learned, don't become a whistleblower, otherwise you will never find a job in corporate America. This, now imagine this, this is 2009. Right? And the core, prior to that, most Ivy League schools and MBA programs spent zilch time on ethics, right? or teaching ethics modules in, 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 for MBAs. So part of the thing is that we react to these systems and we think that, oh, since business schools are known for case studies, let's use case studies method to teach about ethics. Recognizing that if it doesn't work, we need to come up with better models. And, and I think that's part of the challenge with machine learning systems that we ourselves as humans have actually not perfected an ethics learning model. Okay? It's, it's, it's a process, and so we need to figure out. But individual behavior needs to be changed by that particular model. So I, I think I understand the, the comment that was made, and, and the challenge is, I think, that we actually have a systemic ethics problem, not an individual ethics problem. So at a good example, just down the street here, Mark Zuckerberg recently said, well, we'll redesign the algorithms to be better for the humans. And the immediate question came from Wall Street, well, your stock's going to go down, we're going to have to fire you yeah. and get someone else come in. Right, right. And of course, the competitors see that as an opportunity. I think during the financial meltdown, I've talked to a lot of people most of the leaders of the banks had two defects that led them to continue down the path. First one is they don't understand probability. So when they were told there's a 1% chance of this blowing up, they said, well, it's not going to happen on my watch, mm -hmm. obviously, because it's only 1%. And the second one is if they modified their approach and therefore reduced their short-term profitability, they would lose their job and someone else would come in and execute that approach. That wasn't an individual ethics approach or problem. That was a collective problem, and that's a much harder systems challenge, I think. See, I, I, when we teach ethics courses uh, to government leaders and educators, business leaders, the first 30 minutes they spend on telling us how the system is bad, how the system is rigged. Um, and then we start to, you know, after they have sort of spent that much time suggesting that, we start to actually break down the system and we start to ask who builds the system. Uh, it's the 1% that comes to schools such as this, MIT, Harvard, and so on. The question becomes who builds the system. And whether those builders of the system have their set of values clarified to be able to reflect in the system. Most individuals don't have clarity around values. Okay? It's too transactional. Most individuals are not, trade, uh, not trained to understand cost of trade-offs. Okay? But those are exactly the kind of learning that needs to be put in place. Before we simply say, you know, the, the problem with saying that the system is that way is that we create this kind of distance from moral agency. And we begin to you know, say that it's a fight against a monolithic structure. I don't think that is the case. And, and that has been the argument that we have been using mostly to say we are inadequate. To, to bring about these changes. Yeah. I have a question, I think, from the, when you, you had your hand up a minute ago, if you could just get the microphone. So we've, we've talked quite a bit about people who are perhaps at the collegiate or higher level that are entering the workforce soon, but thinking more about children and uh, uh, very young people that are growing up as digital natives, um, they will grow up with AI as part of their life. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe the importance of transparency and how we explain what AI is and machine learning to small children. That, well, that's a very good question. I think part of the challenge is that, part of the challenge with the governance process of AI is that there isn't a whole lot of transparency. Uh, you know, uh, most of them have the sense that these are the inputs, then there's a black box and there comes the output. Uh, and, and, and no company, including the seven big ones, have, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, mostly because of proprietary reasons, have given access to what happens in that black box. So transparency is, is, is something that is, that, is, that is lacking quite a bit. Um, 
I, I do believe, you know, so one of the positive sides of, of AI platforms will be that it would help tremendously with the system of individualized learning. How kids learn and how the system recognizes the strengths and the dispositions and the weaknesses to be able to compensate for that. I think we can build uh, for that system. So it will help kids to become hopefully better learners and so on. So I think they will see a sense of uh, camaraderie of, of some level in that relationship. Kids are funny in that regard. Um, you know, for example, one of our deployments at Media Lab is, is, is using robots in pediatric wards. And you see that kids are more trusting of the robots than another grown up human being. Is it? When they talk to robots, they will tell them everything transparently. Is it? When they talk to grown ups, they make other kinds of stories. Is it? So part of the challenge becomes is, you know, what, what form would this uh, AI take for these kinds of kids? Um, what I hope for is that we don't grow up in a society where the only trusted friend we have is another robot. That would be a sorry state to be in as humans. <laughs> so, uh, before we thank our speaker, I'd just like to announce a related event because this is the first in two events this year that have been organized in a coordinated fashion uh, with the Department of Religious Studies. So, the second event will be the Garfield Forum, which is an annual event organized by the Department of Religious Studies, uh, particularly directed at undergraduates. Everyone is welcome. And that will be on May the 22nd from 4.30 to 6.30 in this. And uh, that will be on the topic of apocalyptic AI. <laughs> <laughs> which then, 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 then you'll appreciate me more. And the speakers will be Jerry Kaplan, who teaches here in International Studies at Stanford, Sylvester Johnson, who's at the Center for Humanities at Virginia Tech, and Robert Girachi, who teaches at the Department of Religious Studies. Thank you. Thank you very much.